thank you everyone for hopping on today. Um, thank you for joining us for our third session of the Accelerating Growth in Bio and Climate Tech Ventures. We're excited to partner with the Tech Futures Group in offering this four-part series. Um, for those that I don't know, my name is Cameron Law. I serve as the Executive Director of the Carlson Center for Innovation and Entrepreneurship um, here at Sacramento State, and we serve as a regional hub and platform for providing approachable and accessible entrepreneurial education community and support to enable startup founders of all backgrounds to start and scale their businesses. And we uh, lead a coalition called the Sacramento Entrepreneurial Growth Alliance, where we were able to receive some funding to, to offer this four-part series in partnership with the Tech Futures Group. And so... We're going to be in good hands today as we dive into uh, go-to-market strategy and i um, looking forward to the conversation today. Just a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we would love for you to all engage through the chat feature. If you have any questions as we're going, I'm going to be keeping my eyes peeled for any questions that come in through the chat. Additionally, um, feel free to use the raised hand feature as we'll be able to do that as well. Um, just to getting ahead of it as well, we will be uh, recording this session, as you can see, and uh, we'll be also following up with the PDF version of the slides that you see today. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Steve, and thanks again for the partnership, and we look forward to the session today. Thanks, Cameron, and welcome, everybody. Um, looks like we still have a couple more coming on here and there. Um, we're going to spend just a couple quick minutes on introductions and and you know for those of you who haven't met us before um established a little bit of bona fides um uh a couple minutes on the series overview which is important because it's going to give you or remind you of um the the lens that we're looking through all these topics on and then we'll dive into go to market issues for you know 35 to 40 minutes um depending on discussion and questions and what we've done today is take a, a slightly bit different tack from um, the prior two weeks in that um, Gregory Thiles joined us, who's got an extensive background in biotech, and we'll try to flip back and forth more between climate and bio than we've been doing. And then as Cameron mentioned, um, he'll be monitoring Q&A in hands, um, and we'll trust him to uh, interrupt on anything that is appropriate in the moment. Um, or uh, queue up questions for the back, because we certainly have, um, you know, Nils, myself, Gregory, and Andy all here, um, and maybe a couple of uh, others packed in the audience who can address um, topics and questions that you may have. Um, <clears throat> so um, you all know Carlson. Um, I'm Steve Plume. I'll be leading much of today's discussion. Uh, in my day job, I manage a you know, $35 million early stage venture fund. Um, Andy, then Gregory, then Nils, could you each give a, a one-liner on kind of your background and, and uh, the credibility for why you're here? And then we'll jump in. Sure. Uh, I'm Andy Leventhal. I am an advisor at Tech Futures Group and uh, have about a half a dozen clients that I help in primarily in climate companies. And I have uh, about 35 years of go-to-market experience in sales and business development and CEO leadership uh, across a variety of industries, but about 15 years in climate. Hi, everyone. I'm Gregory Thiel. I've been with Tech Futures Group for 10 years. Uh, I'm a biologist and biomedical engineer, and I advise companies on how to set up clinical trials, how to go to market, how to raise capital, and uh, I've had three uh, three startups of my own too, so I'm nice, happy to be here with y'all. Hi, I'm Nils Davis. Nils runs with Pills. I have a 30 year career in enterprise software product management. I'm now a coach, an author, and a consultant, and a podcaster. And I have a, built over that time a lot of insights into how to make successful products, both through my own product successes and their failures, and those of others. Great. And so feel free, given those backgrounds, if you've got questions that you want to direct to someone in particular, don't don't worry about it. Don't be shy. Um, great. So as you know, this is the third webinar we've done in a series um, with customer validation and product market fit beforehand. Um, there is so much that could go into go to market. Um, including if you go to any any major source online or in print about what includes go-to-market, 
most of what we've covered in customer validation and product market fit would also fall into the go-to-market bucket. Um, so we're, we're not going to go back deep into those. Um, uh, there's, you know, the other issue on, on the, the extent and complication is we've had to make a lot of choices about what to talk about today in a, you know, 45 to 60 minute webinar. Um, whereas we could easily do a semester on this. Um, so three points before, before we advance. One is if there's something you wonder about that we don't cover today, ask, let's have the discussion. Um, we've got the talent on the team. We've got the experience and the knowledge here. Um, it's your meeting. Jump in and say, hey, what about X? Um, the second is that, you know, climate tech and biotech are wildly different. And within those two umbrellas, you've got, especially in climate tech, the span of different business models and different industry sectors and so on is extraordinary. Um, so, you know, we've tried, to, as I said, we've tried to make the content generally applicable. Andy is available on climate, Gregory on bio, um, and, you know, we'll do the best we can to cover the, the questions that may come up. And then finally, and, and this is really where we'll dive in, uh, as we've done throughout this series, you know, the, the title is investment readiness. Um, so we have um, gone through very specifically the prism of that topic and tried to put ourselves in the chair of the institutional, professional, experienced venture capitalist and what they're going to be looking for when they talk to companies like yours and give you the tools, the techniques, and um, uh, if I remember here and there, I'll give you some, some inside baseball back office commentary on uh, when, when a VC says something to you, what he really means versus what he actually articulated. Um, and, and, and hopefully some of that will help you too. And just, just don't tell any of my colleagues I did you that because they'll take away my union card. Um, so the, the major issue here is de-risking. Um, if you were on the first two, you know, the stats, just to recap quickly, you know, 97, 99% of startups never raise institutional money. Of those that do, another 85, 75 to 85%, depending on the industry and the cycle, never raised the second round. And that's not because they went public or got acquired. It's just they didn't, they didn't make it. They didn't get there. Uh, and then even once you get past the second round, you know, 65, 70% never make the third round. But the odds get better um, every successive round you, you, you make. And so your goal one is to, of course, optimize yourself for the round that you're about to um, try to raise. But if you put yourself in the investor's head, they're also thinking from the first moment you start speaking, what does the second round look like? So you might as well be thinking that as well. Um, what are, you know, how do I convince them that we're a company that's not good just for this round, but for the next round? Um, it'd be interesting if, uh, if people won. I think we did this last week, but uh, as I move on here, maybe maybe put in the chat to Cameron, uh, where are you with funding? Have you have you raised any institutional money? Are you pre-seed? Are you seed? Are you A? Um, and we can, we can talk about that a little bit as we go. Um, so go to market strategy, topic of the day. Um, Let's let's kind of try to make it as as I said general, and then and then we'll dive into specifics. Um, this is really answering the question how you're going to get your commercially readily ready solution into the hands of paying customers, and and all three of those are really important, right? Commercially ready. If you've been, you know, let's imagine that more than seven days have passed between our interim webinars here. That you know, uh, they've been they've been months, not days. So you now have been out in market if you're in climate tech for sure, um, with uh, you know something. You've been climbing that curve towards product market fit, and whether whether someone's paying you yet or not, your product is in the hands of some number of customers. If you're an enterprise, maybe it's a half a dozen to a dozen. If you're in small, medium business, you know, maybe twice that if you're in consumers, you know, hopefully you're into the, into the scores or hundreds by now, or even higher. And you're collecting information about that all the time. 
you may or may not be collecting revenue from these people. And if you are, it's probably at a beta price point or a pilot price or some, you know, this week only special. That's all fine. That's good. But what you need to be doing is collecting all that information. Um, <clears throat> and we'll, we'll dig into what you're going to do with it. The go-to-market strategy is absolutely critical for investment readiness. I cannot tell you how many pitch decks come into our office that either don't address it or give lip service to it. And, and they clearly haven't thought through this. Um, the assumption from the founders seems to be, like, well, if I will build it, they will come and they will pay me money and, and they won't go to my competitors. They'll come to me. And, and the reason for that is seems to be left as an exercise for the interested investor, right? That's never quite addressed. Um, uh, and so it's just, you know, it's, it's critical, but it's overlooked. Um, and Andy and I were talking earlier this week as we we're getting this together. <clears throat> this is one of those really super early checkpoints where the experienced investor is going to write you off. And if they're polite, they'll give you the rest of the meeting and show you to the door. And, they'll, and you'll get an email saying they passed and you'll never have a clue why, because they won't tell you. Um, if they're not polite, they'll just they'll just stop you on slide three and say, yeah, we're done. Thank, thank you for your time, um, which is always you know, kind of a special treat when that happens. Um, we really want to remind you that, you know, we've laid. You need to start your validation before you get to your product market fit, before you get to your go to market. Um, but these are processes that never, ever stop. Um, just because you've done a first pass through customer validation, you're not done, right? Now you're going to put your first product in the market and you're going to go back and validate it. And then you can put your second and go back and validate it. Then you're going to start with go to market. And guess what? It's not going to go quite how you think it's going to go. It might be better. It might be worse. It might just be profoundly different. Um, you're back to product market fit. Maybe you're all the way back to customer validation. Um, I have no idea if this generation of people on the phone, you know, ever played, um, the old shoots and ladders game, but there's that one slide that goes from nearly the end all the way back to the beginning. Don't be surprised if you hit that slide. Um, uh, so, you know, how will you reach your customers? How are you going to do it in, in, a, in really an innovative, disruptive and effective way? Um, and there are, you know, I think about, about, you know, my world is primarily software. Andy lives in, you know, Nils and I kind of live there. Andy lives in climate tech. Um, this is a good model for um, businesses that are driven by electrons, um, which is, you know, most of today's digital economy. Um, Jeff Gregory lives more in a business that's driven by molecules. Um, and so the thing I would add here, and, and Gregory, you should jump in, is this, this may really look different for a molecule business. Your go-to-market strategy may be substantively the same as your liquidity strategy, right? The goal may be to sell your company, not sell your product, um, but you're still going to go right, through Steve. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, Steve, I, keep me honest here, though. Uh, we all of us like to think we're different, right? And that the process is different. So when I think about go-to-market, I really focus on three stages, three aspects. One is one is what you said, customer validation. I mean, you really want to work on molecules that uh, that uh, have a target audience, have people you can make better. Um, then there's a very technical part of this, and that's all through our, our clinical trial process, which may be a bit different, but I know some of you with hardware and, and software you deal with alpha and beta and scale as well. Uh, we just uh, we deal with clinical trials, and they they probably take a lot longer too, and and uh, take more money. And then the last bit for us is operations. Can you actually execute on on an approved mo uh, approved molecule? Uh, can you manufacture it? Can you scale it up? Uh, can you find a partner who can uh, reimburse you? Um, so yeah, I, I think that we all th we always think, like I said, everyone thinks their world is different than than other other industries, other types of companies. But I mean, there's a lot of parallels too. Um, we just have different timelines and different activities, uh, yeah. but there's still our customers. There's still a refinement of the product uh, through, in our case, through trials, and then there's also execution. So, 
And, and yeah, I'll we'll circle back about. on this as we go on, but yeah, I mean, I'd love to talk about it with anyone. Yeah, I think generically these stages are the same for for any new business or at least most new businesses. And then you get into the fine tuning of what matters of your product and your industry sector. Um, and I just, I, I'm going to say it again, because I can't say it too many times. These never stop. Keep doing it. You'll, you'll do this until the day you sell your company. Um, so the way we've structured this is we've, we've created two fictitious companies, one in climate tech and one in biotech. And we're just going to give you, you know, we're, we fast forwarded some months. Um, the fine founders in this audience have done all the work that we've recommended and all their other work that has to be done. And, and now this is the stage where we are. So um, Andy, maybe if you could take the floor and kind of describe where, where the XYZ company is and the, and the challenges they're facing going forward as they think about go to market. Oops, you muted. Sorry, I was muted. Um, so yes, we have created a XYZ climate company. And uh, as I said in the first, probably two sessions, uh, and I'll say it again today, the term climate tech is a very difficult term to wrap our heads around because there are so many segments within the, 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 the umbrella called climate tech. So you might have solar, electric vehicles, batteries, storage, um, carbon accounting, the, the list goes on and on. So there someday in the very near future, we will go, we will put the term to bed like we did with the word internet company. You, you no one would ever dare to say that I work for an internet company. Uh, soon you will not say you work for a climate tech company. But for today's purposes and, and this uh, uh, four, four session track that we're working on, we're, we're using the, the category because there are some characteristics that are similar. So we are, um, the scenario we're trying to paint today is so that for the, for the next 45 minutes, we will be framing the educational uh, uh, material around a, a, a company that has got some customer validation. The, the founding team, usually there's a couple of founders and a, maybe a handful of engineers and, and developers that are putting this hardware or software solution together. Um, they're out talking to customers, some of which, as Steve said, maybe they're already paying, maybe they're not. Uh, but you're working on getting product market fit. So something is in the hands of some number of customers. Um, you've probably raised some amount of money, uh, either that's friends and family or some kind of pre-seed from some outside investors. And that the founders are leading the sales efforts. You haven't gotten to a point yet where there's a bunch of salespeople in the company. That's probably a little bit later stage. I'd say a little bit something we're going to talk about in the next few minutes about what are the kinds of things that are coming around the corner from a company that it's approximately this stage. So we're gonna spend the rest of this presentation talking about what are the things that are necessary to successfully execute and put yourselves in front of an investor community so that they, they take you seriously because they believe what you've got is a credible go-to-market story, that you've got a credible viable product that's gonna meet the needs of some set of customers out there. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. Great, thanks. And Gregory, could you let me advance the slide here? And then in a fit of spontaneous creativity, we named this one the ABC Biotech Company. <laughs> thanks, Steve. Yeah, I, let me just uh, kind of continue to build on what I said with markets, trials, and operations. Uh, those are kind of the three stages that uh, biotech companies go through. I mean, having customers, like I said, it really matters for this uh, this type of company as well. Um, we often think that it's all about the uh, all about the science, uh, but uh, but there does there needs to be um, someone who can get reimbursed uh, for the sale of your uh, of your drug, and and so. Um, so that customer validation piece is relevant, no doubt. Uh, but very quickly, we jump right into uh, into clinical success. Uh, you know, is there real preclinical signs of success for us to even get get after this? Um, is there is there are there grounds for a, a new drug application? Uh, and then we we get into we get into phase one, phase two trials, and um, like I said, it's expensive and. 
those who uh, who are who are envious of of the you know two three four five million dollar raises we 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 get um, it's it's needed and it takes a long time too and it needs to be fairly fairly patient money and um, and so usually a portfolio that has internet companies <laughs> or electron companies uh, they tend not to also have biotech uh, and if they do. Uh, the investors are, are pretty clear that there are different time horizons for those two ty different types of companies. Even within bi the biomedical industry, lar the larger industry, you know, your devices, your digital healthcare companies, your equipment, uh, those those have a different timeline than than biotech. But but then you know after after the whole uh, you know customer validation, the clinical aspects, there still is pricing and reimbursement success that you have to achieve. You have to be able to find a contract research or contract uh, development and manufacturing organization to help you. Um, sales channels matter as well. Um, US or EU or Japan or all three, that's part of your decision-making. Um, just even, you know, just what your operating model is going to look like and then who your partners are. And as Steve alluded to earlier, uh, the exit is often acquisition, acquisition of the molecule, ac acquisition of the talent, uh, not necessarily the commercial people, the commercial strategy people, but certainly the the lab people and the uh, which uh, good lab people are in short supply. So they often go along with the deal as well as well as a molecule that's working its way through approval. So, yeah, I mean, we'll elaborate as we go on. And, and, and certainly I welcome your questions, uh, but I really I really like to see this in the context of customer validation the in the clinic, um, and then the operations actually executing on this. Uh, lately, I've been seeing companies that haven't been able to scale up effectively. And so even though they made it through clinical trials, they haven't been able to effectively get to market. So I'll stop there, Steve, but uh, yeah, uh, let me know when you want me to chime in again, or I'll just jump in. Yep. So we'll, we'll, we'll loop back between Andy and Gregory over the next um, several slides here. Um, <clears throat> so, oops. Um, we've already, you know, as, as I said up front, many, many sources would put all of this stuff into, into the go-to-market phase. Um, we've worked with these topics as foundational to being able to put your go-to-market strategy together. So, you know, we're going to take the, we're going to make the, uh, uh, the simplifying assumption or, or, or future, future tense that, um, you've all identified your beach hard segment, you know what the value prop is, you know who buys and how and why. You've put together your roadmap to product market fit, which is going to, as Gregory was just saying, this can be look incredibly different in biotech than it does in, in climate tech. But, you know, in either case, you know what the target is with, the, with product and solution fit. And, uh, you know, you understand process and duration. So this is all we assume you know you you figured this piece out already, even if in real time in real life you haven't. Um, but and and we can cycle back to any of these that you may have questions by by the end. So what's new? What's new in this section of our of our series here? Um, I go back to something we said in the first webinar. The goal for a startup is to establish a monopoly like market position. Many people have said this. I'm quoting Peter Thiel in his book, Zero to One, which I cannot recommend highly enough. Um, it is, it's a quick read, um, but boy, it's, it's, it's the fastest, uh, you know, quick tutorial on how to be a startup CEO that I can imagine. Um, and, and what are the characteristics here, right? Um, you're going to be, what that means is you want to be the vendor of choice for a very narrow segment of a very large market. And we've talked about that in um, other contexts and frameworks. Uh, the book is called Zero to One by Peter Thiel, T-H-I-E-L. And it's one of the books on the resource slides um, at the end of this deck. Um, um, so let's drill down into monopoly. Like, what does that mean? It means you've got the greatest market share in that segment, um, you know, 80%, 90% if you get, can get it. DOJ is not coming after you. You're a startup. Your, comp your competitors are massively larger than you are. 
Um, what you want is the characteristics of a monopoly, which is greatest amount of share. And what you want is the highest prices. Typically, there are some exceptions here, but you want the highest price you can possibly command in that market segment, because that's what's going to drive your margin that's going to fuel your growth. Um, and you want to be pushing competitors off to the side, you know, like little, I don't know, Lego pieces or something, right? Just get rid of, you know, toy soldiers, get rid of these guys. So how are you going to do that? Well, these are six of the core things that you're going to have to do. Um, and I won't read them all to you here because we're going to go through each of them. Uh, you could argue there are other blue blocks that, that belong on this page, but again, um, decisions and time constraints um, and, and the ability to keep your attention for long enough, we're going to focus on these. And we're going to try to address um, all six of these, both from kind of the general uh, point of view of a, an innovative startup and from climate tech and biotech. Um, let's see, Andy and I, anything else you want to say here before I jump in? I think you covered it. I think we'll get into a little bit more, uh, in the, in the following slides. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So one, one last thing, um, I don't know, you know, it'd be another interesting piece in the chat if people want to, is how many people are on your team right now? Because if you're one person or one person and a dog, this looks like an overwhelming amount of work. Um, these are not solo efforts, right? You know, remember, you're a few months ahead of where you are now. You've got more people on the team. Every single one of these is a team effort where the CEO is contributing but not owning all of it. Or you're, or you're never going to get there and you're going to lose a bunch of the best thinking because, you know. And uh, if you are still at a stage where this looks like it's all on your plate because you've got you as the only founder and you're the CEO and you've got a bunch of devs or technical resources only, then this is overwhelming and you're going to need some help. And hopefully you can find that help through some advisors or consultants or even, you know, friends of the family, friends of the business. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So first off, establish value. Okay. So a little bit of a repetition, but we're, we're presuming that at this point you've established your ideal customer profile. You know what your market entry point is. You did that during customer validation and you further verified it during product development. You've got your problem solution fit, right? Again, identified in the validation, improved during your product market fit evolution. So where are you now? Remember we said up front in the scenario, you've got some customer traction. That means by now you really need to be demonstrating what your climate value is, or if there's another label that's not climate value given what you're doing, but in, in that technology space, what's the inherent value you're delivering and what's the evidence and, and calculation of cost and benefit to your customer or your customer's ecosystem? Um, in, in biotech then, or, or med tech, it's going to be, as Gregory was saying, clinical value and safety. Safety may apply in climate tech as well, depending. And again, evidence of cost and benefit. Where you're going to then have to go with this is pricing. And my colleagues are going to have to like use the hook because I can and have and frequently do talk about pricing for hours at a time. Um, so I'll try to limit myself to two or three minutes here. Are you just going to read your book to us, Stephen? I am. I am. I just uh, will. And then we'll, then we'll queue up my YouTube channel and then we'll go from there. Um, <clears throat> so first of all, and you know, relative to pricing, what's your business model? Are you a product? Are you a service? And keep in mind that either one can be delivered as the other. There's you know, software used to be a product. Now it's a service. Jet engines used to be a product. Now they're a service. Um, you know, you can, you can find this any way you want. Uh, met, you know, the way that medical devices work in our economy, they're not really a product, they're really a service. Now, someone buys them, but in the end, they're charged out of the service. Okay, then what's your purchase model? Um, what's on the page is everything I've seen in, well, most everything I've seen in software and enterprise technology. There may be others. I'm not suggesting this, this is comprehensive. But you really be, ought, ought to be able to think, you really ought to be thinking about what is the purchase model and what you're after is what model fits your customer's purchase model the best. And Steve, I, let, me, um, let me give an example. I, I referenced this last week, but it's a good, a good point to refer, like thinking about um, 
early early products in the early days of solar, um, you had solar panels that you had to buy, and very very few people understood that there was a return on that investment. You were laying out thirty forty thousand dollars for frankly a moderate sized solar system that probably didn't even offset your entire electric bill. Um, and in two thousand and nine or 10, Sunrun came out with a solar lease and allowed people to actually pay as you go. It was sort of a, a monthly payment and, and it changed the dynamics of the market completely. And people felt like they could afford $159 a month versus $40,000 up front, even though maybe the, ultimately there was the same amount of payment over time. And um, that created a completely different strategy. Reimbursement Piece that Steve points out here was really the, the 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 tax credits you got by purchasing solar, which also came late in the game. It wasn't something that was originally available. So a lot of these things, you know, were were hard work and a lot of lobbying that the the early climate tech industry needed to do around uh, around that particular part, the solar solar business. That's it. Yeah, Steve, it's all right. I could jump in here with biotech. Yeah, um, so. This is where we start being a little bit different because, uh, I mean, one of the one of the job titles I've been seeing a lot lately has been value economics uh, in the biopharma industry because an important part about establishing value uh, is convincing a system, a payer system, a payer, uh, an insurance company, or or uh, Stanford or UCSF or Sutter that your drug or you know in a broader sense for biomedical your device actually can reduce cost to the system. And so there's a sense of value there from avoided cost. So that's a really different approach than in some industries. And um, and I don't wanna lose sight of what you said earlier, Steve, about de-risking and the importance of that for what this this webinar is all about. And that is uh, you know investment readiness. And that de-risking is, Yes, it's it's a lab based activity for biotech, but it also is this idea of establishing value and pricing with a pair, with uh, you know in a broader global sense with a government uh, backed healthcare system like the the uh, NHS in the UK or in Canada um, or in the US with these individual insurers or these healthcare systems. So establishing the value of your of your your drug early on about how it can help with avoiding cost and then having a reimbursement code so you can actually uh, uh, price it uh, with these with these customers. So those are all really important things that go beyond the clinic, clinical success for this de-risking concept that you brought up earlier, Steve. Great. Um, I'm watching a comment in, uh, or a thread in the chat about um, carbon reduction. And, um, you know, so I think some interesting answers from, from Andy and from Nils. Um, but let me take that as an example to clarify what I think, what I'm talking about anyway. Um, what you're after is not monopoly over the carbon market or a monopoly over, gosh, I don't know, let's, let's go introduce, let's go compete with Google and get, get a, a monopoly over the search market, right? It's not going to happen. That's impossible. Um, in the same way that no one's going to get a monopoly over the carbon reduction market. What you're after is a monopoly position, a monopoly like position or Peter Thiel's words, um, in a tiny fraction of that market where you are the number one player in a small market with um, a number of customers who all have common characteristics that your answer is the best one for them. And so that could be carbon reduction. It could be a large field of pharmaceuticals or medications. Um, my goodness, you could, you could say the enterprise software market is a coherent market. There are dozens, if not hundreds of companies with monopoly positions in different corners of that enterprise software market. Um, so that would be, um, I hope that clarifies a little what I was trying to say. 
Um, so let me grab the last point on this slide and then um, we'll move on. Price point and willingness to pay should also be something that you have good insight from, um, from your customer validation. Um, <clears throat> the standard way for a new company to price is what I refer to as the junior marketing person model. They take the lowest paid person on the marketing staff, ideally the summer intern, and they send that person off to the websites of half a dozen companies that are generally in the same space and they throw a dart and that's the price point. Um, this is not the way to do pricing people. It's not the right answer. Um, go back to your customer data. What are they measuring their problem by? And you know, we all write proposals and send these contract bids and so on. And I'm convinced after all these years that none of our customers read those. They, they just scroll to the very end and they find a number that you put down and that number has a dollar sign in front of it. And they take that number and they divide it by something in their mind. And they say, yes, that works or no, that's ridiculous. And, and that's how you know whether you're going to engage on the deal or not. And so the trick, one of the tricks to pricing is figuring out What's what's the customer's denominator? And once you've got that, now you're in the right negotiation. Um, and then there's payment terms and there's all kinds of stuff to be done with payment terms and contracts and agreements. And so many companies miss so many easy. I mean, we can have a whole longer conversation about that, but startups in particular seem to be committed to throwing as much friction as possible into deals that should be easy. Um, and especially when you're small, the, the paperwork should be minimal and as, and as non-frictional as possible. Um, so with that, and you guys kind of um, addressed some of it already, um, but is there anything else on the value comments and the pricing comment that Andy or Greg, you want to jump in with relative to our fictional company, sir? Steve, can I just jump in real quick? I, I have this very simplistic rule of thumb about pricing, which is that you should be able to articulate a value that the that the product or solution delivers that's at least 10 times what you charge. If you can't do that, or it's an order of magnitude, something like that, you should rethink things. It's a rule of thumb. It's very simplistic, but customers need to see a lot of value from your product for a lot more than they pay. Yeah. So the, the founder of Skype, whose name escapes me at the moment, um, became famous for extending that. And he said, yeah, that, that, that will get you a successful company. If you want a transformational company, you need an order of magnitude improvement on the revenue side and an order of magnitude decrease in the cost side. And then you're really knocking it out of the park. So I'll, I'll, I'll accept that hundred, a factor of a hundred. Yeah. Um, but hitting both sides, right? Because then you're hitting all decision makers and all, all different um, interest, interests and concerns. Okay. So, you got pricing, you got a customer, you got a market segment. Now our goal is rapid growth. Um, and you know, one of, one of the guys said, well, what's rapid growth? So let's, great, let's talk about that. Um, let me start with the second bullet here. Depending on your industry and your business, you may be after revenue or customer acquisition or both. I can't tell you a priori what you should be doing, right? That's what your business is about and what your investors are looking for. Um, the right answer is what's driving market power, what's driving your monopolistic market share, and what's driving the market value of your company so that when you go out for the next round, you're getting a big step up in valuation, right? So understand those dynamics and, and don't look for them, you know, God, Steve said, look for this. So don't come to my world and look at in an enterprise software. Go to your world, whatever that is, and figure out companies and what they've been acquired, what the successful ones have been acquiring. Um, and, and understand what the growth expectations for a successful company look like. And those vary by sector and those vary by where we are in the economic cycle. So I'll give you an example from my world. Okay, if you come into the enterprise software market now, trying to sell something to enterprise, you have seven years to get from product launch to $100 million in annual recurring revenue. And everybody knows what that line looks like. It's, it's known as three triples and two doubles. 
Um, and that gets you to 100 million in seven years, plus or minus one. If you fall off that, um, if you fall off that curve, you are in the immortal worlds of Don Valentine at Sequoia Capital, you are dead to us and you will not be getting more money, right? And now you're into ugly positions where you're, you're going for an investor change or a valuation change or a CEO change or God knows what change. Um, so you really need to know what, what are the expectations of what your growth needs to look like? Um, and what's the amount of capital it's going to take? Uh, we'll talk about capital efficiency in a few slides here, but you have to be increasing you know, every step up. You've got to be returning how much your what your positive returns to scale in, in every dimension that you're spending sales, marketing, development, customer success. Um, uh, and then, you know, as I'm looking at this, right, the, the top one uh, really goes with the bottom one. But, you know, does your pricing line up with your sales cycle? Um, there are well-established bands in every industry of if you cost this much to this much, here's your channel. This much to this much, that's a different channel. And the, you know, the, uh, an extreme example that I've never seen anyone try but in software, if you're trying to sell something that costs $1,000 a month, but it takes you a nine month sales cycle, yeah, that's not a sustainable business model. You're not, you're gonna burn through all your cash and then wonder what happened. Um, um, and you know, we could spend hours on, on each of these topics, but hopefully that gives you an overview of things to think about. Um, and so what that means is once you understand, sorry, once you understand these topics, and how that's going to fit into what your revenue growth is or what your what your unit growth is. Now you now you know channels and partners because your channel is determined by your price point, by the customer's purchase process. And note, I, I, very specifically in this deck, I've changed the phrase sales process, which is company focused, vendor focused, to purchase process. It's your job to align with the customer's purchase process. That you want them to be buying from you because that's a hell of a lot easier than you selling to them. It's faster, costs less, gets you a higher price point. Um, another determinant of channel and partners is who controls the customer. If you if you slot into some non-competitive company where you're an adjunct to something, they already, man, they are your best friend at the wedding. Go, go buddy up and, and get engaged with them. And the other issue we talked last week about whole product, but what else needs to surround your solution at this point of time? Services, integrations, other technologies, dashboards, overlays. I mean, you tell me, are, are you going to deliver all that? Probably not. You want to focus on the one thing you're super good at, partner up with those. And then all that has to align with your, with your um, channel economics, your growth plan and your expense model. Um, and then your partner contracts and agreement should be as friction free as possible, just like your customer wants you to. Yeah. So uh, Steve, let me uh, yeah. jump in. Don't and, and and to further overwhelm you and the and the blue boxes that we talked about a little or, or, a few minutes ago, um, channel programs, channel marketing, channel sales, and channel management are all complexity to this slide. Do not think as Steve just pointed out rightly, like yeah, so you have a piece to the overall solution and you're going to find a channel partner who's going to sell another piece that's going to one plus one equals three. Managing a channel is not easy. And um, putting programs together to motivate the salespeople at that other company and doing marketing programs and figuring out who's getting paid, who gets more money, who owns the customer, how do you motivate and kind of scale up a channel program like that is 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 not easy. So I'll get to a slide in a few minutes about some of the go-to-market um, blocking and tackling pieces, but sometimes you have to kind of make a choice between a direct sales model and a channel model because you may not have resources to do both. Hey, uh, Andy, can yeah. I interrupt for just a minute? I apologize in advance that I'm out in video. This is Jeff. I can't overemphasize this, you guys. I can't tell you how many of my clients software clients, for an example, and I know we have many other type people on the phone, but, you know, they immediately think that they can outsource even early customer adoption to channel sales partners. I've seen that fail 99% of the time. Um, you've really got to go out and directly engage your prospective audience at first. And like Steve said, I really like that. 
you know, what's their purchase decision making process? And then, you know, once you go through that a couple of times and you've got a repeatable and predictable sales cycle, it's at that point in time you can develop a, a sales playbook. And it's at that point in time you can say, okay, what's going to be a faster, easier, better way to reach, you know, our prospective target markets? Maybe it's direct sales, maybe it's finding a channel partner that you can educate on that sales playbook and and train them and run with them and support them to, you know, to do that. But Anyways, it's 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 super important. You guys do not outsource sales at first. It is just a miserable failure. Yes, yeah, Steve. Recipe uh, Jeff, for failure. Jeff, another way of saying that is typically channels are not going to create a market. They'll fulfill a market. You have to go create the market. And yes. then you tell them how to do it. But you have to do it first. Like, you know, one yeah, one thing I'm to, wondering here to... it is, you know, this, given that these are a lot of pe people that are working on their first startups and haven't done this before, what what does sales channels even mean? I mean, we, you, you're using this term channel, so but kind of there's a, there's like a hundred of them. There's or there's five. Let's say, what are they? Great. Okay. So I'll 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 start a list, and everybody and everyone on the panel should jump in. Um, the cleanest one is direct sales. You're doing a company. You're going to set. You are a company. You are making a sale to another company or to a government organization or something similar, right? So company to company. Typically, that's going to be a direct sale. You're going to have a sales employee, they are going or or sales teams. And he's going to talk about this a bunch in a few minutes. They're going to be running an account strategy against a bunch of named target customers in your industry. And this is typically a multi-month sale. And certainly in the software world, that better be six figures or higher, seven figures ideally. In other industries, the you know the number you know, in Boeing it better be nine figures, um, you know. So it, it really depends on the industry. Um, <clears throat> there are variations on that. It used to be with a software company where we sold a ten million dollar software deal to a really large company, but we had to do it holding hands with Accenture, which was going to be the implementation partner of choice. So it's direct sales with a partner. Um, if you're down in, and again, I'll give you software numbers. So it's an exercise for the interested reader to, um, take them over to your particular industry. If you're in the 25 to $50,000 initial sale, you better be doing what used to be known as telesales. And what this is, is your salespeople are sitting at home in their living room on zoom, on their phone, on Slack, on email, and they're having personal interactions with their prospects and customers, but they're never meeting them unless they're unless they're around the corner of the coffee shop. Um, you can't afford travel. You can't afford time out of the building in that model. Um, you come down below that 10,000 and below. We all are buying software packages that are a thousand to two thousand dollars a year. Maybe they're monthly, maybe they're quarterly right to support our businesses. It's self-service over the net you know, maybe with some email or chat support, if we visited, I don't know, beautiful day, I dot five, beautiful dot AI five times, and we haven't purchased, I'm going to get an email from someone saying, Hey, you've been back here a bunch of times. Now, these days, that's probably an AI, not a human. Um, and then there's pure self service, right? I just go to Amazon and buy what I need. Or, or I go to your website and buy what I need. And I have no expectation. And that's, that's a B2B model, the B2C model, you know, there, there are retail versions of that, both online retail and physical retail. Um, and then the other one that hit in the middle frequently that Andy already mentioned is the VAR or the value added reseller model, where they're actually taking often taking title to your products and reselling them to a customer and they're taking margin in between. And that margin, as Andy was talking about earlier, may include an allocation for them to provide value-added services around your product. So that's a quick list. What else? What did I miss? And Nils just pointed out OEM, which is sort of upscale from where you just said, where you just left off, which is they don't even want the end customer, the partner doesn't even want your name, may not even want your name on it. They want to take the product and wrap it inside something that they do and call it their product 
and um, your, your, they're rebranding your thing under their banner because they've got, for, for a particular reason, there's a whole range of reasons that we won't get into right now, but that's an OEM flavor of a VAR. It's, a, a, it's much more custom um, and they're going to take a huge chunk of the product because they're doing all the sales and marketing and packaging and selling of your thing. So the VAR might take 25 points. An OEM partner may take 75 points. A great example that everyone on this call is going to be familiar with is automotive. You know, you buy a Ford or a Toyota or a Honda or whatever. There are hundreds of vendors who have contributed to that car. Um, but all most of the money is going to Nissan or Honda or Ford. And, and you know, the others are getting fractions on the dollar. Um, okay, so let's, um, since we're kind of there, uh, let's let's take another um, pause. Um, Gregory, we've been talking a lot about kind of IT and um, climate tech for the last five minutes. How would you think about um, the growth cycle and channels and partners from the biotech point of view? Great. Thanks, Steve. Yeah, a, a number of things just to kind of get caught up on the biotech example. Um, you know, maybe it's not a monopoly, but uh, at least it's a strong barrier to entry, and that's uh, FDA or or other other forms of regulatory approval, and uh, and so that that plays a, a significant role, uh, not only for the company, but for back to your your initial point, um, uh, de-risking, and so from the venture pers uh, venture capitalist perspective or the investors perspective, uh, having that type of approval or making strides toward that approval. That's a that's goes in a, a great distance for de-risking. So that's the first first point. Um, second point, uh, the purchase model is is um, sometimes it's through individual clinicians, but usually it's a purchase uh, purchasing agent, a uh, procurement agent uh, with a large uh, large hospital or large buying group, um, and so that's your marketing focus. Uh, yes, you can have some other partners. Doctors can often be partners. Uh, there's a lot of regulations around how you can try to influence them, uh, but uh, but uh, reimbursement people and uh, and uh, doctors are are part of that partner system that you're trying to trying to uh, trying to crack uh, with your new drug. Um, so I think those are some of the ways that makes uh, uh, makes biotech different from what we've been talking about. Okay, cool. Um... I'm going to roll back. I saw one other question up here um, about, you know, I gave the numbers about uh, software companies getting from, from zero to a hundred million in seven years. And someone said, my God, that's, you know, that's hundred percent growth per year, at least. Yes, it is. Absolutely. So, so the common numbers, year one by definition is a million, right? Whatever it is, you know, your investor is going to say they shipped a million. Year two expectation is three. Year three is nine. Year four is 27. Year five is 50 and year six is 100. And it'll give you one year of grace to hit that 100 million number. That's the curve you have to stay on to have a successful software exit. Um, that's how aggressive it is. I imagine it is very similar in other industries that I don't know as well. Um, but that's the standard you're up against. And that's why so many companies fail even after they get their first. And that, my friends, is why I go to market and your go-to-market plan and your go-to-market execution plan are so absolutely critical because a lot of those companies that don't meet the bar have fantastic technology, have incredible innovation, have brilliant people. What they don't have is execution. And by the time you hit the scale model, it's not the best tech that wins, it's the execution that wins. Um, all right, so competitive moat. So you know, back to Mr. Thiel and zero to one. Look, everybody, every company is going to be different. This is a partial list of, um, you know, competitive things that you might have in your, have in your um, toolkit and be thinking about. Um, but let's talk about the different types of competition for a moment in general. And then uh, back to Greg and Andy. Um, so for most innovative companies doing something new, doing nothing is the major competition, right? If you found something that people, you know, as we talked about in the first session, they don't even recognize that it's a problem until you put it in their face. Well, they're by definition, they're not doing anything about it. 
Um, but what that means is you cannot underestimate the power of inertia, um, both in terms of energy and, um, you know, and, and this is why we talk so much about early adopters and visionaries, because they're the ones who recognize that this is a big problem they need to solve. So find them. The next is DIY. You know, companies are solving it for themselves with some internal processes and resources. Um, probably doesn't work, but it might be the Band-Aid they need. Um, and the other issue there around inertia is that means some number of employees and probably not a few executives define their employment by solving the problem that you're promising you're going to take away from them. So, you know, you do have this person, this um, human thing of, oh, my God, those guys are a threat to my job. And it's a it's the unusual and insightful human who says, oh, man, I'd so much rather be doing something else if only we could get this in. Um yeah, one thing I always say is if they've tried it themselves and failed, though, that's a great indicator that there is a need for the thing you're doing. Right. And, and it's also a great opportunity for you to sell to them, right? Because it shows that they're they're willing to invest. It's worth investing in, but they failed to to get the result they want. Yeah. So, so it's two, more, two sides. And, and I totally agree. And two more quick um, um, categories. Other startups... Don't be so naive as to think that if you've had the idea, no one else has. Um, if you've come into my office and presented your plan, within three months on either side, five more companies have come in and presented a very similar plan. And so my, my choice as an executive is, am I going to make a bet in this industry or not? And which of these five or six companies am I going to bet on? And so I would just use that as reinforcement for why all this stuff is so critical. Um, and then there are the big incumbents. And of course, they're not doing what you're doing because what you're doing is new. They might not have thought of it. It's going to disrupt their bit current business model. It's a pain in the neck and they'd rather ignore it if they possibly can. And so many founders use that as, oh, those guys will never come my way. No, that is false. The moment you start getting traction, they will come your way. And the first thing they will try to do is block you. Um, from getting the deals and saying and, and blackballing you and saying, oh, their stuff doesn't work. And I've heard so many bad things. And yada, da, da. the second thing they will try to do is block you in the customer with agreements and promises and contracts and try to just lock you out. Um, they'll fight you on price. They'll try other dirty tricks. And in the end, they're going to start reverse engineering your solution and seeing if they can deliver it under their and, and trust me, your team of Bulgarian engineers is not any better than their team of Bulgarian engineers, right? There has to be something fundamental about your business that means they can't come after you. And that's what the moat is about. And then it's also execution. Um, um, and execution resources, cash is top, headcount and capacity, and of course the skills, the partners that we've talked about and other GTM assets. So in a minute, Andy's going to dive deep into GTM assets here. Before we go there, Gregory, anything else you would say about, about competition um, on the biotech side? Well, one of the benefits in biotech is that you have some regulatory barriers to entry. And so there, there are some benefits of that. In addition, if you are successful in getting a reimbursement, a reimbursable uh, drug or, or device, um, then that acts as a barrier to entry as well. So I, I think those two aspects are, in a sense, uh, systemic within bi biotech. And if you can leverage both of those, then that's how you build uh, build up some of these barriers to entry. Not exactly a monopoly, complete monopoly system, as we have a lot of generics and biologics that are competing and, and other countries in the world don't have a strict uh, uh, um, enforcement of uh, regulatory barriers, but um, but those are th that's what makes biotech a bit differently uh, because you can tap into some of these systemic uh, barriers to entry. So I think that's the only point I'd add there. Okay, great. So as I mentioned up front, there are any number of stovepipes we could go way way deep on. Um, pick pick a freight, pick a bullet off any of these slides, and we can spend an hour. Um, we're not going to do that because like it's one o'clock already. Um, but Andy's going to take a, 
take the floor here for a few minutes and talk about um, uh, some of the execution resources that you're going to have that that you should be thinking about as you develop your go-to-market execution plan. Yep. Thanks. So just refresh the uh, for, to refresh everybody. We started this session off by saying we took a a scenario of a, of a company that's a genericized climate tech company that's a few founders, some customer validation, a product is some version of your product is in the market with some set of customers. Some are paying, maybe not paying yet, but there are people who are helping you understand how nailed down and valid and solid is your go-to-market, I mean, your uh, product market fit. So we put together here a partial list of some of the assets that a sales and marketing uh, team has is or has put or will be putting together and what you should be thinking about in your in your financial plan, your go-to-market plan. In fact, someone on the chat earlier on had asked, what's the difference between marketing and go-to-market? Um, marketing is a subset of go-to-market. Go-to-market is a, a comprehensive plan that includes people, resources, such as these. So um, I'll talk a little bit more about sort of the sales targets. We did talk a minute ago about channels. So yes, direct sales is a channel along with resellers and bars and online and so on. Um, I like to think about a, a named account list as a, as a starting point um, because you should know exactly who your perfect customer would be if you had your, your dream and you can wave your magic wand who would those top 25 customers be? That You should know that list and someone in the organization should be out putting together a lead gen plan, how we're gonna go reach those people either by buying lists or through partners or through LinkedIn, um, you know, hunting and pecking and finding people that way. The other part of that is, you know, who's gonna go do the selling inside the company? Are these hunters or are these farmers or are they a combination of both? Hunters are people going to go find new logos and, and expand and, and farmers are going to be the ones who are going to expand the existing customers. Sometimes you might not have the luxury of getting different kinds of people. So the same person is doing both. Your marketing assets, as you can imagine, this is all the things that a marketing team puts together from website and making sure your messaging's right, call to actions, that's what CTAs are, differentiators, making sure that there's lots of content across the different ways you interact with your prospective customers so they understand why they buy this product. Um, the customer offer, what is the thing? What are you offering? How does it work? Do you have a beta offering? What are the pricing tiers? Um, maybe there's a, a, a version for um, low end users and maybe there's a, an enterprise version, um, but making sure that there's really a packaged offer for, for anyone who wants to touch the product and making sure that there's a way for them to be successful once they, they hit the buy button or negotiate a contract, what is the onboarding plan? How do they get trained and adopt the product? Um, the organization that's actually going and doing the work, um, lots and lots of thinking around this, and I, I don't wanna try to drill into too much on the organization, but whatever organization you have um, is both sales and marketing and all the supporting uh, components to that, but those are the people who need tools. And there are, there are unlimited or thousands of companies that sell some kind of a CRM, sales automation um, tool set. There's TCO calculators. You can build your own. You can buy them. There's training and enablement platforms. There's call recording platforms. There's a lot of different tools out there. And you can go crazy and go overboard and spend too much money on those tools. So thinking about you know, how you're engaging with the customers and what data you're collecting and what data should you be collecting so that you can understand your pipeline, because those are the kinds of metrics that you're going to need to be able to talk to an investor and say, here's why we're going to be able to reach that $100 million in five years. Here's what's going to happen in one year, three years, and five years. And here's the data and metrics that we're looking to collect so we know how to scale up the people and the resources to, to hit those numbers. As you know, if you've got a $3,500 price point, you're not hiring enterprise salespeople. You better have a digital and online mechanism to do that. If you have a million dollar price point, then what kind of salespeople are you gonna hire to be able to go do that? And, and when do you hire them? 
So that's what I, the tools and the organization and the strategy all kind of go hand in hand to get, uh, uh, on this flavor. Next slide. So once you understand the business problem and how you solve it, and again, typically the two dials you're thinking about are, does our product reduce cost for the customer or does it increase revenue? You know, these are very, very simple. So click one, one button there. Thank you. So you're, you're gonna be putting together your annual and monthly sales targets, um, the target audience, you know, what are these people expecting? Um, you'll see that in just a second. Setting the right kinds of goals. As I said a, a minute ago, um, what is the activity that you need to track so that you can be informed about how to what's coming around the corner? Um, if you haven't done this before, um, sales models are complicated. Uh, the more products you offer, the more complicated, the different kinds of salespeople you have adds complexity. But making sure that these goals, you know, when you're in your early, you can keep the goals quite simple and quite, quite direct. Um, it gets a little complicated as you start to scale up. And then making sure that you have the right kind of sales uh, incentives. So what kind of commission plan, bonus plan, spiffs that you want to offer so you're incenting the right kind of people. Um, there's definitely lots of ways to compensate salespeople, but it has a lot to do with the kind of product and the price point that you're you're offering. Click, uh, click two buttons, I think. One more. Yeah. And so some of the segmentation strategies, um, you know, if you're thinking about, we, we and this is really not climate related, this is just any, you could be selling hardware, you could be selling software, services. I don't care what, if you're in healthcare or you're biotech or, or climate tech, these are, the, there's so many different ways. And on my next slide, I'll get into this, but just thinking about how would you, how would you maybe break out things? You know, it could be size of organization. You know, we know that our tier one named accounts they buy centrally in the United States. Um, you know, these are the key influencers in, in my particular market. Uh, and maybe we want to hire a different salesperson to go after some of the tier two accounts. Maybe they have, we, we divide that up by number of offices or employees. You know, sometimes it's actually better to go after smaller companies than the bigger ones because it's easier to get to decision makers. And if you're trying to get referenceability, it's a lot easier to get to that, to that kind of uh, buyer. You can go ahead to the next slide. Um, I, I bring this out because I, I'm, I've actually got three clients right now that are all struggling with how do we start hiring people and how do we decide? And there are lots of ways to decide, but here are three most common um, and I and and geography is the the one I've got the big caution sign on, but it is the one that is very alluring. There's a lot of sex appeal to being an international customer a uh, uh, company. You've got international customers. Oftentimes, companies in other parts of the world are underserved. There's a very big kind of entrepreneurial startup community in the U.S. It doesn't exist in other parts of the world, and yet. Other customer customers in other parts of the world have the same problems as American companies, but be very careful. Um, this is a very very expensive and emotionally and physically draining exercise for startups that are not resourced. Um, so I would say that yes, that is a definite way you could segment. Like oh well, we've got two salespeople and we've got fifty names of of, uh, of of customers or prospects. And most of them are outside the United States. I would I would broach that topic very carefully, and I would think about other ways of doing it, maybe based on account size, like we had in the previous slide, or maybe going vertical by vertical, um, finding things that are common amongst our you know our user base in in you know selling into financial services or selling into um, software companies or selling into uh, healthcare. But jumping directly into international markets is a really, really expensive and very difficult process to go through. Hey, so Andy, can there. I interrupt for just a minute? Just one quick sure. footnote. Yep. Gregory, I'd love to hear, uh, hear you chime in on this. The one exception I've seen is um, in, the, in, the, in the med tech space, maybe something needs FDA approval. And that can be a lengthy process in the States. I've had clients that have successfully strategically determined to go to market like in, um, I think it was Brazil at one point in time, 
they had a little bit of a benefit because they had they, there was a couple of Brazilians on the team. But they, in that instance, even though they were a U.S. based company, they chose to go to market first in Brazil because they made they didn't need to get the get FDA approval necessarily down there to try to start getting some feedback and whatnot. So, Gregory, I don't know if you've run into that before, if that's valid or maybe just a one off. But have you run into that? Yeah, I, I can comment on that. Uh, many of my clients who do try to go international, most countries uh, will mimic either European or U.S. or, or Japanese standards. And and so um, I've had very few cases, Jeff, that uh, where companies have actually been able to succeed with going to market without U.S. approval or European approval. One of the one of those two. Um, and so. I don't know if I can say that that's a one-off, but uh, most of my clients uh, have not had had it easier in other places. It's actually been more difficult, in part because of the lack of uh, intellectual property protection. So, so, so Jeff, I I agree, I agree that there are lanes that are available to uh, companies. You know, if your customers are asking for product in Brazil and Japan. I'm not saying that you that those aren't real customers. I'm saying that you need to really evaluate the ability to support that customer given all the demands they're going to have that a US customer won't have. So it's all I'm saying is caution. Um, I think in in the climate world, you've got a very difficult regulatory framework to to lay to get uh, power sources, you know, get clean, clean energy or to access, uh, get permits for putting something in the ground or using uh, my last company with car carbon dioxide removal using ocean seawater. It was impossible to get those things permitted. So it was far a bigger market outside the United States because they could get into in the door within 18 months instead of four years in the United States. It's just an expensive proposition and you need to be prepare to, to cover those expenses and think that your team is now going to be working nights and weekends instead of just U.S. hours. That's all. Yeah. So just keep your eyes open when you when you have these international opportunities. Got it. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would boil everything you just said down to, you know, if you make it intensely personal for the people on this on this call, I stand by the scarcest resource in any startup is the time of the CEO. Yeah. And as soon as you start splitting yourself across time zones and putting yourself on airplanes, you're handicapping yourself. Yep. All right. Um, Andy, anything else you want to say on this? No. On this wedge? Okay. Um, let's see. Greg was, oops. Oh, oh, that was my point. Be careful. <laughs> it can spin on you. I love it. I love it. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to... If we go back here, Greg, any any commentary from biotech point of view that you'd want to you know add or modify? Sure, sure. Uh, let me just, um, in some ways, just kind of recap a little bit and then make two two new points. Um, so, from this whole concept of de-risking for investors, I think really communicating customer validation and that this molecule has a place in the market. I think that's really critical, number one. Number two, in the clinic, uh, successfully making it through trials uh, and getting approval, essential for de-risking. Uh, de and so savvy biotech investors, they watch these two for sure. The third one, which is really operations, and this is less of a regulated uh, aspect. This is more of a kind of delivery or execution aspect. And that is, can you maintain quality? Can you maintain a manufacturing system that was approved? And those are audited activities. So there is a regulatory aspect to it, but it's also an execution aspect for the companies and showing that you have the personnel and the systems in place. Those are ways to de-risk this for investors as well. So. Um, I know I talked about reimbursement. I know I talked about pricing and partnerships with doctors. Those are all important points for de-risking uh, for go-to-market. But quality and manufacturing systems, ability to scale up, uh, those are important aspects as well. Great. 
Okay, so let me get back through here. Ta da. Okay. Um, so if you pull this all together, all right, this gets into something that as, as a VC, this drives me crazy a bit. Um, I remember right at the beginning of this, of this call, we talked about all the moving pieces. Um, this is just a selection of the key performance indicators that, a, that any company might be tracking, right? If some of these don't matter for you, cross them off. You have my blessing but figure out which ones are really tracking to the, the current performance and the long-term health of your business and track those rigorously and religiously. But then if we come back to your pitch deck, right? We started this with what's the 10 to 15 pages you're gonna take to your, your venture capitalist. Um, these all have to tie out. Uh, they have to be in sync with each other. And I hope we've made the case as we've gone through the last hour that pricing relates to channel, relates to your average selling price, which is going to relate to your revenue based on how many customers you're attracting at that price, which is hugely dependent on the sales cycle length and what happens in your sales funnel and where people fall out of the sales funnel and what your lead generation plan is, right? You have to have all of this thought out and it's going to show up in expense ratios on the next slide. Um, but it is absolutely critical for there to be consistency among your sales approach, your marketing approach, your development approach, your partner approach, your customer success approach, right? So they all work together. Um, and please, guys, make sure they're based in reality. Um, I, I cannot tell you how many decks I see from software companies, right? No, no one in this room would send me something like this but they promise faster revenue growth than Twitter with better operating margins than Google by year four. Okay, and, and oh, they'll only ever need one round. Okay, this, this, this does not exist in this timeline or in this world or in the solar system, right? They just didn't do their homework. They didn't think through it. So, so that's Steve, a easy task. Steve, how do, you, how do you square that statement up with the statement you made 10 minutes ago that said, $100 million is expected in seven years. It seems those two things seem inconsistent to help 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 the audience get through that. Like Fair enough. Okay, so Twitter was way faster than that. Um, we'll have to, someone can look up the numbers. Um, but by year seven of revenue, I'm going to guess they were well into the hundreds of millions. Um, and uh, Google's business is to print cash. That's what they do for a living. They get paid to print cash. Um, now, obviously, that's kind of an exaggeration and joke, but they are the most um, they are the most profitable country in the history of you know the last seven universes. Um, maybe Nvidia is taking them over, um, but don't. But they certainly didn't get there by year three, right? They got there in year twelve or year fifteen. And so a way to a way to think about this is um, don't promise results that only the best of the best have delivered. It just puts a target on your back. Right. This is why I go back to know what the norms are in your industry, achieve, you know, forecast the norms and make sure you have the business model that su can support them and that they can be pressure tested. I think, um, that, I think that's your next couple of slides, yeah. right? It's the, the guardrails. Yeah. So here are the guardrails. So this is this is climate tech. Right, and your mileage may vary, right? If my goodness, if your R and D is seventy two instead of seventy, that's not cause for concern. If your R and D is ninety five, eh, okay, let's or, or your G, or even worse, your G and A is thirty five. Um, so we're not going to go through the details of this slide or the next slide, but you know, post these on your wall somewhere. Right. And yes, every company is different. And every entrepreneur that comes through my door explains to me why his expense model has to be different from standard. And the problem is, by the time companies get to success, they've all converged on these standard models. Right. And the, and the ones who came in and started off with something that's that's out of whack converged. And the ones who insisted on staying out of whack failed. So and just just to re remind everybody, um, we've put this broad this is a very broad set of assumptions based on this broad term called climate tech if you're in the hydrogen production business it's going to be very different than if you're in the battery business versus if you're a carbon accounting software product so 
don't don't take these numbers as gospel. Go put it on the wall and then go validate them for your own unique category. Okay. We're just trying to give you some guidelines here about on the far left here, it's early stage, mid stage, late stage, et cetera. So go go validate these numbers for yourself. Right. And the, the thing I'd add to that, it's on the bottom of the page here. Usually you will find these reported as a percent of revenue rather than as a percent of total spend. So if you look across these swim lanes, they all add up to 100. All right. Every early stage, mid stage, late stage company is spending far more than 100 percent of revenue of revenue on expense. Right. That's OK. Right. But but you want to normalize it in both directions. How much will your investors allow you to lose? And then how is that? total expense allocated across these functions. Um, second version, you know, again, broad guardrails in biotech, um, the same caveats about this is total expense, not revenue. The same caveats that as you move along, your R&D should be coming down, your COGS is going to be going up, your sales and marketing is going to be going up, and you want to keep your GNA as low and clean as you can. Um, Gregory, anything else to add to that at a high level? No, no, that's that's spot on. I mean, uh, that that commercialization stage, uh, uh, it surprises everyone who isn't familiar with the industry, just how high uh, sales and marketing uh, is as a percentage. So, yeah, that's that's a key uh, key for this industry. Yeah. And it isn't I mean, it, it is in my world of enterprise software as well. Once you're into scaling, your R&D may be coming down, your cog should be under control, your GA is under control. And companies may be spending 150% of revenue on sales and marketing. And that's standard, that's normal, that's expected, because that's what it takes to throw gas on the fire. But if you if you hit all your other milestones, that's what your investors want you to do. Okay, and this is, you know, again, this to me, I've 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 revisited over the course of this hour. Make sure your models tie out. This is where you really understand if your models tie out or not. Are you getting this kind of consistency? And I think Andy said it earlier, but my goodness, go take your financial models to your existing angel investors, to your friends and family, to your business school classmates, to your LinkedIn colleagues, whatever. Get them beaten to crap and rebuilt over and over again before you show them to a venture. Because your average venture guy is going to process this slide in three seconds or less and say, ah, I get it, or no, this makes no sense whatsoever. And and at the no sense whatsoever, you're you're going to be challenged to get that one back. Um, pitfalls, okay. Well, I just hit one of them, right? Make sure everything sinks out. Um, roll back from that. So many founders get obsessed with their technical vision, um, and you know I said it at the early, but you know if I build it, they will come. Nah, not not so much. Very rare. Um, uh, the this kind of second stage of that is hearing what you expect to hear and want to hear to say, okay, yeah, everyone I show this to gets it. Uh, they don't. I can promise you they don't because they're coming from their perspective, their customer perspective or channel partner perspective or regulatory perspective or whoever it may be. And they are not connecting the dots in the same way you are. And you've got to pressure test that. Um, indications of this, how, you know, as an investor, how do you know? Ah, your founder comes in and says, oh, the customers are stupid. They don't understand anything. Ah, okay. I need a new CEO. Um, uh, let's see, what are some others? Uh, founders who can't adapt. That's why I had resiliency and flexibility up top. Okay, something changed. It's not what we expected. Okay, now what? Come on, management team, figure it out. It might be much better than they expected, right? And you have to be able to, ready to capitalize on that. It's not always worse. Um, and it's how you, it's how you adapt. Um, but, but keep in mind, you know, backroom baseball, venture capital is a ruthless business. Um, and there is a well-known VC whom I know who has above his desk, the sign only 243 more CEO firing days until Christmas. And he lives by it, right? It's not a joke. Um, and you know, Meet, meet the goals or fall off the path. Um, and so the sooner you understand that and live in that person's chair, the more you're going to be able to deal with what they're looking for. Um, and really, if I'm going to sum up what they're looking for, right, resiliency and flexibility. We've been hammering today on models. All models are wrong. 
right? Some are useful. So why do you build the model? To prove the quality of your thinking, to prove the quality of your creativity, to prove how you think about th how things change. Because they'll take your model and they'll start asking, what if this happens? What if that happens? Have you done your homework? Do you know the structure and economics of winners? And are you living in those guardrails? Um, are you consistent? Can you adapt? And how's, how's your team going to respond to the unexpected? Because uh, there are some great companies that have been built in markets that were totally unexpected, but the team figured it out and moved there. Um, and so in the end, whether it's your the go-to-market piece or just your whole deck, right? This, this is what the VCs are looking for. Is it logical? Can you believe it? Do you have the resources to pull it off? Um, if you succeed, is this a billion dollar exit? If you fail, do I still get my money back because it's done well enough? Um, um, have you got that comp that you know competitive moat so that um, even though our strategy is compelling, no one else can copy it? Um, and and again, would they copy it is entirely the wrong question. Could they copy it, and what would we do about it is the right question to answer. Um, and then finally, have, is it complete? Have you ticked off all the boxes? Because they're gonna put you through the due diligence. You might as well be prepared. Um, you know, and, and and so thank you. And so I guess the last thing I'll say on this slide, and then and then we'll wrap, is um, uh, it's it's tough for companies at your stage. Um, keep in mind that a VC never has a good reason to say no. If you're anywhere in that person's sector, if you're not a complete idiot, if you haven't brought forth a fundamentally stupid idea, the only rational response from VC is, hey, this looks really good. Keep me posted. That does not mean they're interested in you. That means they have enough lack of disinterest and enough time in their lives that it's worth them to check in on you every five for five minutes each quarter and figure out if um, if if you've actually uncovered anything. So so don't eat the happy food. Um, you know, keep in mind if they say check in with you next quarter. Okay, you have to play that game, but you better bring them something fundamentally different if you want to get their money. Um, and with that, thank you. Um, We've had some good questions as we go through. Um, resources I mentioned, um, you know, these are two good ones that we called on in this book. In this, I haven't, you know, and, and here's what we used last time. I recommend all of these um, and all of those. I, I think the ones I've mentioned the most in these three webinars have been zero to one and um, the sales learning curve. And I encourage all of you to sign on next week when Paul Bazo will be taking um, everybody through the climactic deck on investor readiness. Thank you all for um, your attention and engagement. And Cameron, have we got anything else that we should address? Perfect. Well, I don't see any new questions and we were pretty diligent in asking, answering them as we've been going. So um, I, I'll pause to see if there's any just final questions, but um, as we do so, wanted to say thank you to all the, the speakers and just the conversation throughout the um, presentation, and we're getting some some thumbs up there, so great information shared. Uh, just in wrapping, we will be following up again with this recording, so if there's certain elements that you want to go back to, um, to reference back, um, be sure to check that out, um, and additionally, we'll be following up with a PDF version of these slides. Um, if there's any feedback or questions, don't hesitate to um, respond to the email when I follow up with the resources, but we look forward to seeing you next week as we go through um, the section with Paul. Um, and uh, with that, I will pause. I don't see any additional questions, so um, I think we can call it, call it a close. Great. Okay. Thank you to all the audience members. Thank you to my co-distinguished panelists, um, and we'll see you next Thursday with Mr. Baza. Thank you all. all right. Be well, we'll see you next week. Have a great one.